E pluribus unum, out of many, one. We should recognize that phrase from American history and its placement on the official seal of the United States. But the phrase reaches back into Greek and Roman history and the idea of family unity. And then growing out of that family unity is the community, the village and the town, and then the city, and eventually the nation. In U.S. history, it was wrapped around the idea of how 13 colonies bound themselves to one another under one law, the U.S. Constitution. Last week, we began our study of 1 Corinthians by examining the idea of unity among people of diverse backgrounds. Paul wrote his letter to provide a stability for an unstable church. He was trying to help a divided, fractured group of Christians who were aligning themselves in groups around all kinds of irrelevant things to perfect unity in the cross of Christ. And so he immediately called them to stop fighting over nonsense and come together to unify, to have genuine unity. And that's the title of our study for, and from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Let's begin by reading verse 10, because it's the critical verse, and it's one that we're going to read repeatedly over and over until it's just ingrained in your brain, because this is the key verse to understanding the purpose and meaning of the book. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. This leads us then to a huge question about unity, and that is, how can the people of God have unity? How can the church of Christ, his church, his people, made up of all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds, obtain and maintain unity? How can we have e pluribus unum, out of many, one? How can we have this genuine unity? Well, right off the bat, we have to understand the framework for church unity isn't unity in diversity. That's the idea of, well, we're just going to agree to disagree and pretend that there aren't, aren't any real differences. And the idea behind this is just to accept the fact that we don't agree about much of anything. But instead of working out the differences and coming to a real unity, to a common mind, we ignore the differences and act as if they don't exist, and we call that unity. It isn't. Ignoring disagreements isn't unity. That movement crops up from time to time, claiming to be biblical, but it isn't. Paul's framework for unity is something completely different. It's one mind, one way of thinking. Not many ways, but one. True unity is only possible when we all surrender to the revelation of God's will. There is no unity if we insist that our own ideas get equal treatment and are to be treated as if true, even when they aren't. Now, true unity, genuine unity, makes following Christ difficult because it requires a surrender of our will to God's. We're all unique individuals with various backgrounds, and it's like that today, and it was no different in Corinth. In a few, in a few moments, toward the end of the study, we'll look at some of those diverse people. But first, we have to examine God's standard for unity. How does He insist or draw, call us to draw together to be unified? Because even in this country, here in America, and that's why this is an American missionary, I'm preaching primarily to Americans, even in America with its hyper-individualism, God still has the final say on the doctrines that He will accept. We don't. It's not me and it's not you. None of us are the ones who say, well, this is the doctrine. God is the one that says that. Well, let's go back to, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, and let's begin looking at some of the things that Paul says here in this verse that help us find unity. The New American Standard reads, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree. That's underlined and in italics there on the monitor. hope you can see that. In the Greek, and some English versions say, say the same things. In other words, Paul is saying, let's agree to agree on what we're going to say. Instead of agree to disagree, let's, let's agree to agree on what, we, what we're going to say. 
The ideas we express in words must agree. The ideas have to agree. Now, the words can be different, but the ideas can't. Now, this is one of those areas of conflict where if we're not careful, we can become the word police. And I hate word police. That's the idea of, of we demand that people say what the Bible teaches, and we also demand that they use the very same words that we use. In other words, we're the word police. If you don't say it exactly the way I do, then you're wrong, even if you're saying the same thing just in different words. And that's not what Paul means by this. In a language as rich as English, there are many ways to say the same thing. So, as long as we're saying what the Bible teaches, don't get hung up on specific words, that the, especially the ones we prefer, as if our choice of wording is the standard. It's not. The Bible is the standard. Of course, we must say what it says, not what we want it to say, and we can't force everybody to use the words that we want them to use. Let them say what, in, in English, what God says. They may use different words, and that's okay, as long as they say what God says. Now, let's go back to chapter 1 and verse 10, and let's look at another portion, part of how we develop this unity, this genuine unity, and that's in chapter 1 again in verse 10. And it says, notice there on the screen or on the monitor, that there be no divisions among you. And that's actually a pretty good translation of the, the, what the phrase in Greek because the actual word is a word for a tear in fabric or in cloth. And it's used for a similar tear, metaphorically, in the fabric of a group that should be one. They're one they should be one, but they're torn apart. Let me illustrate it this way. If you bought a new dress or a suit and you got home to find that it had a tear in the fabric, would you say, oh well, Unity and diversity is great. No. No. You'd return it immediately because it's ruined. And it's even worse when God's people are being torn apart by teachers saying different things. We can't accept that. It cannot be tolerated. But James, you ask me, okay, how can we ever say the same things when we're all so pluribus, so many, so many, so different? Well, I'm glad you asked because Paul answers that question in verse 10 as well. Playing off the word for tear, he used a word for mending what is broken or torn. The New American Standard says, made complete, that you be made complete. So the idea is that as a group, we come together, all the different threads, the different members are sewn and together into one whole unit, one whole cloth. And if there's a tear, the tear is mended so that it, that it disappears. You don't see it at all. It's like the cloth has never been torn. It's back together as one, not a bunch of torn, disparate pieces just kind of clumped together. If there is a tear, we mend it. We don't take all these pieces and these, these strange parts and just throw them together and wrap them in a string and say, here's a beautiful something. We don't want a bunch of mismatched pieces that are sewn together into some kind of ugly monstrosity that no one would recognize, much less wear. It's blending them into a whole unity according to the divine pattern so that it becomes one unified in Christ. And here's how it's done. We think the same thoughts and decide the same decisions. Look at the next phrase, in the same mind. The same mind there in verse 10 is the idea of the same kind of thoughts, the same kind of thinking. Have you ever worked with someone or been around someone long enough, maybe your spouse, that you end up thinking like them and they think like you, that you think alike? That's what God wants his people to do. That he wants us thinking alike because we spend so much time together looking at the same sort of source, the same information, the Bible, and studying it and learning it and growing from it so that we then are able to think alike because it permeates our thought. It shapes how we think. The last phrase there, in the same judgment, means to have the same opinions, to have God's opinion. And the word there is opinion judgment, yeah, uh, decision, or purpose. In other words, we need to dump our personal opinions for God's opinion. And the only way to do that is to look in God's Word to find out what He thinks. See, that's the key to unity. 
Now you know why it's so rare. Most of us aren't willing to let go of our own opinions and submit to God's. We want to do things our, our way instead of doing it His way. Now, one of my intentions with these studies is to dig straight into the Word of God and find out what God says so that we can have unity. Instead of projecting my opinions onto God's words, to have unity with other believers. Now, is that going to be easy? No. It's absolutely difficult. It is hard to do. And you have to hold me accountable by measuring what I say against God's Word. But you have to remember something. If you're going to hold me accountable to God's standard, you're going to have to hold yourself accountable to the same standard. Even the Corinthians were held to the same standard. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to notice what he says in verses 4 through 7. Here about the speech, the knowledge, and the testimony that they had. They had all had the same thing. And they needed to unify around it, unite around it, and let it set them uh, straight and let it lead them. They weren't doing it. Chapter 1, verse 4. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched by Him. So they, they had everything they needed in Christ. In all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you're not lacking in any gift. They didn't lack anything. They had everything they needed. They had the, enough, the speech, the words, the knowledge, the testimony to tell them what they needed to do to maintain genuine unity. But they wouldn't do it. But Because it's, it's instead of uniting around it, they were fighting over irrelevant issues. The key to, to unity is found in thinking the same things, coming to the same judgments or opinions, and then saying the same things. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a challenge. That's a challenge too many of us simply will not accept. We would rather take the easy way out and, of thinking our own way, holding our own opinions, and saying what we want to say, even if no one else agrees. Least of all, God. What he thinks is irrelevant to us if that's our way of thinking. And unity is impossible when people think like that and act like that and then claim to believe in God. God, I believe in you, but now, hey, keep your, no keep your nose out of my business. That's the way much of the religious world lives today. And that's, that's why there's so much confusion and strife. Well, let's take a few minutes before we finish to find out just who some of the pluribus were that were needed to work on their unum there in Corinth. Because if they can do it, if they can unify, so can we. And there are two very, very important people we need to meet, and that's Priscilla and Aquila. And that's back over in Acts chapter 18. In Acts the 18th chapter, Paul arrives in Corinth and he meets a couple, a Jewish couple named Ananias, or excuse me, Aquila and Priscilla. In chapter 18, verses 1 through 3. After these things, that is Paul, left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native Pont of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. He came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. So Paul finds this couple, Aquila and Priscilla, there in Corinth. Now, whether or not they're Christians before he meets them, we don't know. But they become fast friends. They become close friends. And he's working with them and works with them. And then when he leaves, they go with him. Now, they had left. They were from Pontus, which is in Asia Minor. And then they had gone to Rome. And now they about, came about halfway between Rome and their home in Pontus to the city of Corinth. Paul meets them there. And they're working, and Paul's preaching and teaching. And so either they're already Christians or they become Christians very quickly because of Paul's teaching. Either way, I, I don't know, and I'm not going to speculate. And so, because there's just no reason. They were quick friends with Paul, and when he leaves, they go with him. In Acts chapter 18, verse 18, Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. So they left Corinth with him after 18 months there. But they're in that 18 months time, they're heavily involved in the church there in Corinth because of their close relationship with Paul. So how did these natives of Asia Minor who came to Corinth by way of Rome fit in? Well, it's simple. Even though they were foreigners, 
And even though they were short timers, they only stayed there 18 months, they thought the same thing, they had the same opinions, and they said the same things Paul said. But interestingly enough, even though they had left Corinth, that was not the end of their influence on the church there. So when they, when they got to the city of Ephesus, which is in Asia Minor, not far from their home, Paul, they remained there, and Paul went on back to Antioch. And while they were in Ephesus, they met a man named Apollos. And Apollos shows up in, Car- in the Corinthian letter because he's somebody that influences the Corinthians, and they're trying to pit Apollos against Paul, and Paul's saying, stop that nonsense. Apollos was about as different from Aquila and Priscilla as anybody could get, even though they were, he was Jewish. They were tent makers, and we don't know about their education, but they were tent makers. They, they were, worked with their hands. Apollos apparently was a student, was a teacher, was someone who was an educated man. He, he was an Alexandrian Jew in Alexandria and Egypt, so that means he was from Africa instead of Asia Minor, a long ways away, different culture, different city, different background other than their common Jewishness and, and knowledge of the Scripture. He was also an educated man. This is go to Acts 18. Verse 24, so, now a Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scripture. So he was very intelligent, very educated, very well spoken. That's eloquent means that the guy can speak. He's the kind of guy that you hear him speak, you say, I could listen to this guy for hours. Kind of, kind of speaker that every preacher really secretly hopes and wishes they were. But there's something else about him that we learn in the text in verses 25 and 26. He's an ignorant, unsaved man. Look into verse 25. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit means he was just fired up. It doesn't mean he received any gift of the Holy Spirit, anything like that whatsoever. It's talking about his spirit is fired up for God. But notice something, and he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus. So he was talking about Jesus Accurately, except for one problem, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. He had heard about the baptism of John, and John was saying that here that the Christ was coming, the Messiah was coming, and that's all that, that Apollos knew. He did not know about Jesus. He did not know that Jesus had come in fulfillment of the messenger John's message that the Messiah was coming. And there's, here's how Aquila and Pil- uh, Priscilla expand their influence on Corinth. Notice what they do. Verse 26, And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So you, you know a lot and you're in good, in good shape, except you're still lost because you're not in Christ. So let, me, let us tell you about Christ. He's come. He came. And so they explain that to him, and the whole world just opens up to Apollos. Now he can become a preacher of the gospel, which is what he does. He becomes a gospel preacher in verses 27 and 28, and guess where he goes to preach? That's right, the city of Corinth, verse 27. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, and Corinth is a church there in Achaia, which is Greek, uh, Greece, the main church, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. So he, he is preaching the gospel and he's telling the people about Jesus and the people there that have believed in Jesus, they're being helped by this. He's instructing and training and teaching and showing them how to be unified in Christ. Well, there's some opposition, verse 28, but he, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now I want us to think about something here. This account refutes the whole unity and diversity idea. Because there's just simply no way that unity and diversity agree to disagree is acceptable. Because, notice what they do. Well, Priscilla and Aquila didn't think it was okay for him to think something different from the truth. They took him aside and they corrected him. What he was teaching was accurate, but not completely, so they taught him more accurately. They corrected him. Second, when Apollos got to Corinth, he didn't say, well, let's agree to disagree. If you don't want to believe in the Christ, that's all right. Judaism is just fine. He refuted the Jews to show them that Jesus of Nazareth is the Christ. 
and that that's who they had to believe in to be saved. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how people are willing to disagree with me. I'll be talking to someone, and they'll disagree with what I'm saying, and they'll try to correct me. And then accuse me of being disagreeable and stubborn because I didn't agree with them. Let's chew on that for a minute. They disagree with me and accuse me of being disagreeable because I don't agree with them. Well, who started the disagreement in the first place? It was mutual, actually. They thought one thing, I thought another, and we're trying to work together to find unity, and we can't because their idea is different from what I think the Bible teaches. And all of a sudden, I'm the bad guy? No, it doesn't work that way. The truth is the truth. We may both be wrong, but we can't both be right if we disagree. Scripture is the one that we have to go back to to see what is correct. And what happens when people think like that is they think they are the standard of measurement instead of God. And that's not the unity of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. Well, let's look at some of the converts in Corinth as we wrap up our study. Some Jews and Greeks. Go back to Acts chapter 18 or we're still in Acts chapter 18, and, they were, and, and notice that some Jews and Greeks, both Jews and Greeks are believing the gospel. After these things, after these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew. And uh, let's go down to verse 4. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. But when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. So he preached first to the Jews, then to the Gentiles. He's trying to persuade anybody and everybody to listen that Jesus is the Christ. And there were believers from Jews and Greeks. There were some there that were Jews that we see in a guy named Titus Justus and another guy named Crispus in verses seven, uh, verse eight, verses seven and eight. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And so you had people believing in Christ, being baptized into Christ for the remission of their sins, Jew and Greek, but predominantly here he's talking about Jews because these are people that are connected to the synagogue. But if you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we see that there are some Gentiles as well specified here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and verses 14 and 16, he names two. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Paul's concern here is that, that, that there's a thought that it, whoever baptized you is what makes you special. No, that's not, that's not the point. Baptism make, brings you into Christ regardless of who does it. So he mentions Gaius, and then verse 16, Now I did baptize also the house of Stephanus, and Stephanus was a Greek. And so here in Christ, Jews and Greeks are being brought Together, unified, genuine unity in Jesus Christ. And what was causing the unum, the unity among all those pluribus? The cross of Christ. And while they didn't always get it right, it was, it was what Paul pointed them towards to bring them back together. Unify around the cross. And that's where we learn the same thoughts, get the same opinions, so that we say the same things. Well, one last thought on this idea of unity and how it connects to truth, and then we'll be finished for this study. Notice in verse 2 that Paul identifies them as saints, having been sanctified in Christ. Verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ, that means set apart or made holy, by, in Christ is saints by calling. So all the Christians in Corinth are saints. That means all Christians everywhere, any person who is a believer in Jesus Christ, a, an obedient, repentant believer in Christ, they're saints. Ordinary people. It's an identity for every Christian, not super special ones, as some teach. It means all who are set apart, who are called by the gospel. They heed the call of gospel, made holy unto God, and then that's how they become Christian, become saints. And how that? By the gospel into fellowship with Christ. In verse 9 of chapter 1, he says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son. So we're called to be saints, called saints, called by the gospel of Jesus Christ into fellowship with Jesus.
And that's what makes us think the same thing, have the same opinion, and say the same thing through the Word of God. It's objective revelation, available to everyone, the Bible. And this leaves no room for personal opinions and ideas masquerading as some private message from God. We have to all have to go to the Scripture. God doesn't want our opinions. He wants us to unify around His own opinion, which leads us to this last question. I want you to contemplate this. Will we surrender to God's opinions or insist on keeping our own? You know, we know the right answer. So the real question is, will we do the right thing? Please let me know if I can help you in doing the right thing in any way. If you have any questions about the gospel or how to be saved, feel free to reach out to me on Facebook Messenger or by email at anamericanmissionarybg at gmail.com. I'll be glad to do anything I can for you. Thank you for watching. Until next time, I'm James McClenney, praying that your heart will be filled with the glory of God.